Did you know that over 15% of San Franciscans live in dangerous soft story buildings that may not be ready to survive the next earthquake? Well, in today's episode of Stay Safe, we're gonna talk more about San Francisco's soft story buildings down here at the Epicenter. Hi everybody, I'm Patrick Odellini, Chief Resilience Officer and Director of Earthquake Safety for the City and County of San Francisco. Uh, we're down here at the Epicenter, which is our pop-up collaborative space down in the South Market area of San Francisco, where we occupy a storefront where we can talk about earthquake policy and educate everybody in, in San Francisco, from the homeowner who has never done anything to their house, to the most advanced structural engineer that we have working around here. And speaking of which, I'm actually joined by one of those engineers. I'm here joined by Kelly Cobean today, who's going to talk to us a little bit about soft story buildings that we see in San Francisco. How are you doing, Kelly? Very well. Thank you for having me here. Of course. Um, so in front of us here we have a little bit of a model of a, of a typical San Francisco soft story building. Um, when I see this a lot of times I think this is some of the most beautiful architecture that our city has. But a lot of people don't know that these are problematic buildings. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the risks that we see in these types of buildings. Soft stories in general we have seen as vulnerable in past earthquakes including uh, significant damage in both the Loma Prieta and the Northridge earthquake to this uh, type of building and character of building. When we talk about the soft or weak story, what we're talking about is generally a ground story that has less wall or other bracing to resist the lateral forces or the horizontal forces that might be imposed by the earthquake. And uh, so we're looking for something that is particularly weak or soft in this ground story. Now, this is a wonderful example of uh, what some of the uh, residential buildings that are soft stories in San Francisco look like. And and the one thing that I would point out here is that the upper floors of this building have residential units. They have not only a fair amount of wall around the exterior of the building, but they also have very extensive walls in the interior around bedrooms and bathrooms and corridors and other things that provide an awful lot of bracing. So this has a significant amount of bracing in the upper stories and is significantly less vulnerable in those stories. Now, very often we get either a garage or storage or some sometimes commercial occupancy in this ground story. And that very often not only has a whole lot less perimeter wall, but it often has little or no wall on the interior. That wall is your earthquake bracing, and so we see very significant bracing up in the top floor and very little bracing in the bottom. And so when the earthquake comes and hits, it tries to push that ground floor over, and there's very little to keep it from moving, uh, from degrading, and eventually potentially going far enough that a collapse could occur. So we know they're vulnerable, and they're vulnerable because of the characteristics of this ground story. So Kelly, is this only a problem that we see in buildings in San Francisco? No, this is uh, certainly a national problem, more acute in the western states and other states that have higher seismic hazard, uh, but definitely throughout California, up into Oregon, Washington, and moving out east into other states, this kind of building exists and this kind of building is vulnerable. And it's important to note, Kelly, I mean, you know, when you were involved with the Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety, I mean, this was a different way of thinking about these types of things. Uh, you know, we had a community member group of over 100 people that were involved, and you were one of them. Um, tell us about how those conversations went. Why, why did we decide as a city or as a community to start thinking about fixing these types of buildings? There were a lot of aspects that were considered well beyond just the engineering answer that these are vulnerable. Um, and that effort brought in uh, a lot of people from different aspects of the community that looked at the importance of these buildings to the housing stock and the possible ramifications of losing this housing in the case of an earthquake, the financial implications, the historic preservation implications, where as you mentioned, these are very handsome looking buildings that are uh, important to the appearance of the city and what makes the city of San Francisco something that tourists and uh, people outside are interested in coming and visiting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such an amazing story when you think about the 10 years that the community spent talking about this issue 
but we actually did something about it. You know, now we have an ordinance that's put in place that's going to protect 120,000 residents in San Francisco and retrofit over 5,000 buildings by 2020. So I think, you know, I'd love, just love to say on behalf of everybody from the city and county of San Francisco, residents and employees, we want to say thank you for the work that you've done to help push this forward and help make people more aware of these issues. And it was an absolutely fantastic community effort. In an earthquake, you know, what, what happens to these types of buildings? You know, what, what, what are we expecting to see here? What happens when the earthquake comes along is that it moves the ground both horizontally and vertically, but it's mostly the horizontal motion that we're concerned about, and it starts moving the building back and forth and pushing on it sideways. And as you can see when I start pushing it, the upper stories with all of the walls are staying fairly stiff and fairly straight up. Mm -hmm. And the lower floors, once you push them enough, actually do collapse, just like I did mm -hmm. right there. So, so luckily, uh, we can put this building right back up where it came from, so it's yes. a lot easier. So Kelly, obviously, these aren't real shear walls and real frames here. But when we start to retrofit soft story buildings, why don't you tell me about how this starts to make the property more the building more stiff? The uh, easiest and uh, most cost-effective type of bracing that you can put in is either to put in a brand new wall um, or potentially to go in and strengthen a wall that's already there where you don't need to have an opening. Where you have maybe a garage door or access to commercial space, you might go to a steel frame or other type of bracing system that provides the strength and stiffness necessary, but at the same time um, allows continued use of that area. But together, some combination of walls and frames or other mm -hmm. tools that are in the retrofit uh, toolkit can bring the building up to the uh, strength that's required in order to remove the vulnerability from the building. Uh, so that when ground shaking comes, it in fact is a whole lot more resistant mm -hmm. and less vulnerable. And ideally, this story down here would be made uh, as uh, strong and stiff as the stories above. And if I'm a property owner that, that wants to retrofit my building, what's the first thing I should do? The first thing that you should do is to find a uh, professional that can come in and help you evaluate your building in order to, one, figure out that indeed it does need to be retrofitted and to um, give you some idea of what that retrofit might look like um, and start evaluation and design to help you determine the retrofit required. Well, Kelly, I can't thank you enough for being here today. Thank you so much for your wealth of information on how we can take care of our soft story problem in San Francisco. And for you, the viewer, if you have any other questions, please feel free to visit our website at www.sfgov.org backslash ESIP. I'm Patrick Odellini, stay safe.